All right. Welcome everybody to our first uh, meeting for this program. Uh, before we get started with Carol talking about the Vero Beaches Ice Age site, I'd like Jane Templeton to tell us about one fundraiser coming up. Twice a year, Field Manor has a fundraiser in order to support our educational programs and the other things we're doing out there. And the fall one is our oyster roast, where we, rem where we remember the fact that they came and settled on Merritt Island in 1868 in October. So we, in October, have an oyster roast to celebrate it, just as people have done on the island for years. Um, it's fried oysters and fish. There's corn, there's all sorts of other stuff. There's music. There's a full pavilion so you can get out underneath the shade. There are tours of the house available. It's kind of a fun afternoon. It's a Saturday afternoon, October 20th. It starts at 4 o'clock. You're all welcome to come. If I have tickets right here, if you buy tickets today, in other words, pre-sales, when you come out, you give your ticket to them and they give you an extra drink ticket. So that's kind of a nice deal. If you buy two tickets, it's another $5 deal because it's adults are $35 at single tickets. Two adults together are only 60 So a couple of bargains in there. See me if you'd like tickets. Anytime, we'd be glad to see you out there. And just remember, we're, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Yep. All right, and then one more uh, program note is in November, uh, in place of our November meeting, we're going to have a bus trip to the um, Museum of Arts and Sciences up in Daytona, as well as the Brown Museum, and that's going to be Friday, October 26th. Uh, there's flyers in the front. Uh, we encourage everyone to buy tickets. The deadline is September 26th. So if you have any questions, see us afterwards, and um, we'll answer the questions. All right, so today we welcome Carol Robertson, who will speak to us today about the Vero Beaches Ice Age site. Uh, Carol is a retired school teacher and is presently the chairperson of the Educational Outreach for the Old Vero Ice Age Sites Committee, OVISC. Um, she has a lifelong vocational interest in archaeology, and about five years ago, when the archaeological investigation of the Vero Beaches site uh, Carol became involved with it and has led um, talks like this. She's also led site digs, I think. And oh yeah, I did site tours for four years. Uh, the whole time the dig was open. Right. Yeah. And then, go ahead. So without further ado, uh, Carol, please welcome. Yeah. So what do I do? Just right back. Oh, okay. Is that good? Yeah. How many of you know about the I, this particular site? Do you know anything about it? No. A, a good, goodly number know, most of you don't. Um, the history of it, the really deep, this is an historical society, so this is really deep history. Um, two and a half million years ago, well after the demise of the dinosaurs, by the way, just to keep your archaeological and historical eras straight. Um, two and a half mil million years ago and now, between that period of time, there have been about 20 oscillations of temperature, major oscillations of temperature, which we would call ice ages. The last uh, peaked at the last ice age peaked at 22,000 years ago. So a complete oscillation might be 100,000 years, which would work out to two and a half million years ago. There have been 20 of these oscillations. Um, they have to do with the tilt of the earth and positions of things and so on that caused this, which is another whole scientific thing that I, under, I don't totally understand, of course, but um, that's what it has to do with. Um, it, it has nothing to do with climate change now, except that we're, human beings are accelerating this process in the very near history. You know, in the last 50 years or 100 years, we've, we've made a temperature change rising because we're at the end or of an ice age. We're in an interglacial period right now. And what was supposed to take, I'll say, 5,000 years, it may take 200 years 
now because we have aggravated it a good deal. Uh, but that's another whole story. Anyway, probably several ice ages ago, or, the, or between ice ages, um, the megafauna, which just means big animals, started to migrate from Siberia down through an ice-free corridor, which I'll show you some pictures of, um, in Alaska and then down into Canada and so on. We're talking about Western Canada and Alaska. There was an ice-free corridor. And these animals, we know, migrated through an area that we call today Beringia. And this big museum up there, great to go to because they, they have found so many animal things. I was up in Alaska some years ago and they just washed them out of the um, side of a hill. You know, they'll put a pressure hose on it and mammoth tusks fall out of the hill. It's quite amazing. And, um, but anyway, that's, so the animals were here. Much later, Homo sapiens, like us, like perhaps the guy in the picture here, um, Pleistocene people, uh, began to migrate into North and South America, what we would call the Western Hemisphere, the New World. And they came slowly but surely. We are not entirely sure of how they came. They may have come following the animals through Alaska and Canada, or they may have even come in very crude boats along the coast. Um, we don't know. We do know that we have records all through the Americas of them being here 15 to 13,000 BC. So, uh, and, and on, of course. We're Homo sapiens and we're here now. Um, they may or may not have led directly to the, what we would call the present day Indian population, native population. They may partially have come from the European side. We don't know these things because archaeologists have not found enough. Now, how would they know? Let's say they did find some. I understand in Melbourne they have found some human remains from this very period, just as they have in Vero Beach. How would they know? Well, they can DNA it. Ancient DNA, let's say it was European DNA. Right? Then they'd know people came from there. Let's say it was Asian DNA. They know they came from there. That's the kind of thing they do. They can DNA animals, and they know where that mammoth originally came from. Did it come from Siberia or wherever? It, you know, we all carry DNA. Okay, so let me um, let me go through a little bit what I'd like to do uh, in the next half hour, 40, 40 minutes, let's say, is to go through what is happening there. The people that they are finding the remains of, they um, are homo sapiens, just like us. The same brain capacity and the same stature, the same thinking ability as we have. And so you have to bring that knowledge to you, you're listening here, that these are not Neanderthals and, and more primitive than that. They are homo sapiens, just like us. Um, you can see by this guy, and of course we don't know what they look like exactly, but you can see by this guy that he's got a stone tool in one hand and a spear and a, a stone implement on the end. They were Stone Age people. By the way, the bow and arrow hadn't even been thought of yet. But they did have something. They had a, a, a tool, a technology that attached, in a sense, a lever to the end of their spear. It's called an atl atl, A-T-L, A-T-L, atl atl. The atl atl made a kind of lever because then when they threw it, it extended their arm and shot the spear twice as far and twice as fast. And so that was Stone Age technology. Let's take a look at this, see if I'm doing it. Right. So this has to point right at this, right? At the, the front of the projector, yeah. No, yes? Yeah, front of the projector. No, no, step back a couple. <laughs> this projector. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it works.
that's when the boss killed <laughs> So I, okay. Anyway, this might be a kind of scene from the Vero Beach Day. Uh, we know a few things about what these people were looking for. Let me give you a little history on that. They were wanderers. They, as we said, they are Stone Age people. We know that the megafauna, which just means big animals, were here in, I keep saying Bureau Beach, but certainly in Melbourne and all through the Florida Peninsula. In fact, the Florida Peninsula was like a cul-de-sac. I mean, there was no place for them to go after that. And so it is particularly rich in the variety of animals and all species that there were in the Florida Peninsula. And let me just digress by saying, after I'm done speaking, there are good pictures there that you can come and look at, and good replica artifacts that these people were using, and real fossils, and you can handle them, and so on. Um, if you're interested, also, just one other thing, there's a couple copies of a book here about the subject, of, a terrific book, I've read it, I own one. Um, uh, an author named Rody Johnson from Bureau Beach has written about lots that I'm telling you, but lots more too. Okay, anyway. So this might be a scene from 13,000 years ago. It's interesting to know a couple things. One is that um, Florida was twice as wide, twice as wide as it is today, from 22,000 years to 13,000 years ago. The peninsula itself was much fatter. It was, it was much drier. It was much more like an African savanna. So the kinds of animals they might have there look sort of familiar. Um, any thoughts, any of you guys can figure out why there was so, uh, why it was so much wider? Sea level was lower because? Ice. 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 Yeah. The ice, the ice age was at its height, as I said, 22,000 years ago. The ocean all over the world was 350 feet lower. Now you wouldn't notice that on the California coast because it's mountains, right? What's the difference? 350 feet, you know, the mountain is high. But in a place like Florida that's very low and flat and close to sea level, so much water was sucked up into these ice sheets that covered you know, all of the northern and southern parts of the planet Earth. Uh, they were two miles thick. No exaggeration, no typo. Two miles of ice, two miles of ice on top of Canada and Siberia mm -hmm. and Alaska and so on. That it sucked up so much fresh water into this ice that it was, it had to come from somewhere and it came out of the oceans. So that's kind of interesting. This, this might be a scene. The place that they found where they are doing the Vero Beach dig is uh, there are two dune ridges right paralleling US 1 in Vero Beach. If you know where the little Vero Beach airport is, you know exactly where the dig is. Uh, there, it's on the west side of US 1 going south. It's, the, it's by the airport. And um, at, in the ancient days, 20,000 years ago, there were three streams that came into the area and settled in a low boggy place. So maybe at some times a year it might be a lake, other times it might be a swamp, other times it might just be a bog. But the animals were looking for water. You know, picture the scenes you've seen in Africa with the big animals gathering around the, the water holes. That's exactly what was there. There were animals that were hunting them, like wolves, and then there were people hunting them. And so they began to find <coughs> lots of bones. Uh, this is an aerial shot. You can see, if you look carefully, US-1 going north and south there, that kind of diagonal over on the right. And then you can see a road called Aviation Boulevard, which indicates that's on the way to the airport. But that, that is where the site is. It's in the slightly lower. That big, dark, thing going right to left is a drainage canal. In 1914, they were going to dig it. They wanted to drain this swampy area I just talked about from the prehistoric days. They started to dig the drainage ditch, 
and the bones were literally falling out of the banks. An interesting aside, they got the dredges to dig the canal in 1914 from the ones they, the very ones they used to, they had just finished the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. And they got them up here, they got them in Vero Beach, and those are the very dredges, several of them anyway, that were used. Anyway, the bones started falling out. Vero Beach had 300 people in those days, 100 years ago. And they were like, this was international news. And they had much cruder techniques, no DNA and no carbon-14 dating, to date things and you know what it was and so on. But they recognized human bones when they saw them. And they uh, were right about the layer of earth that they were in. And so they, scientists then, archaeologists then said, these are from 13,000 years ago. And they were, they were right. Okay, whoops, now I go back one. <laughs> All right, this is what I was talking about. These are some of the Ice Age animals. I just wanted, did I skip yet another thing? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry for my total ineptitude. All right, there's Florida, looking twice as wide as it is now. The black line indicates where the land probably was. How do they know this? Because they find land animal bones out in the Gulf of Mexico. Fishermen pull them up when they're, um, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I am really in that. There's something wrong. There, okay, now I know where I am. All right, these are the animals that uh, did come down from Alaska and, and were found in that period of time. Some perfectly normal animals. You can see raccoons and squirrels that still exist today. But the megafauna, the really big guys, are gone. Okay, this is um, the book I talked about, Rody Johnson. This is his wife uh, at the Florida Museum of Natural History, which is in where? Daytona or something? Gainesville. And where? Gainesville. Gainesville. Yeah, and there she is standing next to a Florida uh, mammoth. Uh, okay, this is what the ice age might have looked like. There was no ice in Florida or Texas, but look at Canada and then down over New York State and <laughs> Illinois and so on and so forth. You can see that the corridor starting to, the ice-free corridor is starting to open up. If you look at where Alaska is, you can see that little wormy split there. But that eventually opened up and that allowed the animals between ice ages to come down. So they were here before people. Okay, this I showed you. These, this is one of those 1914 dredges from the Panama Canal. But this is in Florida now. This is, you know, these switch faster than I can get my finger off it. This is uh, 1914. They were just digging there around the banks of the canal. It's a very old photograph, so it's kind of fuzzy, but you can see a guy doing it. You can see a tent where he's covered a dig area. Okay. This is the schematic of the photograph I showed you. So you see what they call the main canal. The three arrows show where they found human remains to the right, uh, to the, on the north bank and the south bank. And you can see US 1. But it, it's a drawing of what they were doing and the photograph I showed you. That's the swampy area they were trying to create. This is what one of the things they found. They found many, 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 many things of animals and people. But this is the uh, skull of um, a female, it says there a man, but it was a female that was found there. This has gone missing. They sent it to be preserved somehow. Their idea of preserving in those days was to shellac it or dip it in paraffin, which of course ruined it for any DNA they were gonna get out of it. But that's, I mean, that was 100 years ago. Um, these are some of the things, and it, the drawing up at the top shows the earth layers. And that's how archaeologists find out stuff, right? They keep very close track on what layer they're digging in. And think about it, archaeologists are always destroying evidence as they go. You know, you dig through it, you're, it's gone. So they have to work excruciatingly slow and carefully, and they do. But these are some things from 100 years ago that they found. These are some old things. 
look at this one. The biggest one here, Vera, was an old, old town. They say 125,000 years ago. Well, they're just wrong. It was in the newspaper, but newspapers aren't always right, as we know. Um, and yeah, that doesn't change, exactly. And this is uh, the same skull. So it's a fragment, of course. Uh, they were probably accidental deaths. There was no, they, they just died, maybe hunting animals or something. They were, they were not graves. Um, now, this bone. About 10, 12 years ago, an amateur in Vero Beach found the bone, the one on the bottom, the thing on the bottom. And he, you know, threw it in a box. And anyway, one day he rinsed the mud off it. And with the water hitting it, he saw that a drawing, which he has made bigger, up there. It's not it. Now, it's hard to see, but it's a mammoth. Mm -hmm. You can see the curving line that goes like that is its back. You can see some lines down to the bottom. Uh, when they drew it carefully, they realized, it. well, think about that. Somebody 15,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago, used a piece of flat bone, maybe from a giant ground sloth or maybe from one of these animals himself, and used it as a surface. At which, in, on which to carve this, and he had to have been looking at it, right? And he had to be a human being that would do this. So, hmm, good. This, this is what jump started, and then people remembered they had found all this stuff a hundred years ago, and that kind of jump started the whole Vero, the present day Vero, um, dig. And it's called his name is James Kennedy, so it's called the Kennedy Bone. There's a, a rough drawing that he made of what it looked like to him. And it does look, I've seen the bone a couple times, displayed in the Bureau Library and so on. Um, then he sold it, because it's his, and he could. And I hear he sold it for $35,000, which, if it is what it is, and it was checked out with, in many labs that it was, you know, bone from that kind of animal, all that sort of thing. Um, it, he, he, whoever bought it, it's somewhere, and they got a bargain. Um, okay. After a couple of years after he found it, the committee, the old Vero Ice Age Sites Committee, was um, formed to really get serious about finding this stuff. And there was a great buzz in town for years. And they, they partnered with Mercyhurst University to do this. The things down there. And, um, and they, they're not partnering with them anymore because Mercyhurst itself was having some money problems. That's another story. But in the beginning, for a couple of years, they partnered with that university, which is up in Pennsylvania. And um, this man, Dr. James Adavasio, is, uh, well, now he's in, he's in his 70s and he's retired. But he was the head of the School of Archaeology. In uh, at Mercyhurst, and he led a dig called the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. Has anybody ever heard of that? Okay, it's a really famous paleo site in Pennsylvania, and so he was the lead archaeologist on that. Right now, he's here in Florida working for us full time. Um, he's a very renowned guy. Once they got the committee going. They wanted, they had to get permission from the town and the county and so on to start digging. And they realized when they dug that canal a hundred years ago, they dumped all of the stuff they dug out onto the earth, you know, along the canal. They were clearing the canal and just dumping it. It raised that bank about eight feet. If you can picture the process, right? They're digging it out, dumping it on the side, moving along, digging it out, dumping it on the side. And so they had this eight foot ridge along the side of that drainage canal. They had to get through that. That was ruined for scientific reasons. It was ruined. And so they had to get down to the clean layers. And so here they are digging down, uh, they call it the overburden. It was, it was junk as far as the, um, the archaeologists, the first scientific group. And then they put um, up this thing to cover the site they had determined they were going to dig on, and they went back to old records to find the best spot. The man in black on the left-hand side is our present, not Dr. Adavasio, but he's the head archaeologist 
for the whole project locally because Dr. Anabasio was still working for Mercyhurst at the time. And that's what it looked like. And you can see clearly it's kind of down in a pit. It happens to be eight feet below that ground level. And that's where they started the dig. And it's called the weather port. There's an aerial view. Now you can really see. If you really look up in the very upper right corner, which is the piece of sky, that's the airport. That's landing strips and whatever there. There's the original canal they dug over on the right. And then uh, there's some county buildings over on the top left. And, whoops. Um, the, here are the, uh, a lot of them were grad students or young, just graduated archaeologists who came to work on this. It was a, an important, it's important dig. It's one of the most important in southern United States because of, of what they went on to find there. Um, and here they are. They marked, the first thing they did is mark it off in one meter squares with string. You can see the string there. And um, you can see the tools. Volunteers by the dozens and dozens and dozens, I was one of them, would screen through the material from the overburden. And these people here are not archaeologists, they're volunteers. And you can see what they're doing. Those trays have a mesh maybe eighth inch, eighth inch to sixteenth inch, inch mesh, tongue twister, uh, that they put, you know, just shovelfuls of dirt from the dig in and if they're hanging on strings so they can do this, just like you were sieving flour, and then, you know, that drops down, and then they start with sometimes a magnifying glass looking at what's in there. Um, you see the big pile of dirt in the back? That's, that is the overburden. That is the stuff they dug out. And, um, and that's what the, these are volunteers. That's what the volunteers are looking through. Wonderful things were found there. Thousands of pieces of lakes, which are the chips they, they took off the stone to make a, a, a point, an arrowhead, and animal bones of all sorts, some of which, uh, they're not right there, but I mean the animals themselves, the pictures are there for afterwards. Okay, this is uh, the guy way on the left with his arms folded there with the brown shorts on. That is uh, our head archaeologist and they're just considering what they're doing you can see what they're doing I led the tours all through this for years and uh, every time I went into the tent the weather port it was a whole different story and they found something else uh, you can see these the little uh, beads of white going up and down are marking layers they, they're very they GPS the heck out of this I mean everything there is there is one archaeologist who does nothing that but sit there with a big computer GPS kind of thing and if they find a tiny piece of carbon or anything they GPS its location in space you know up down sideways and, and then they mark it the deepest pit there is um, what oh it says it there 22,000 years deep Okay, so the highest one is 11,000 years deep to 22,000 years deep. That's what you're looking at. That doesn't mean it's 22 feet down or anything like that. It just means the passage of time. And, and you can clearly see there are different layers. Um, it, it spans uh, 11,000 years there from the higher piece to the other. And, the, and how do they uncover all that? Looks like they take a, a good bread knife to it, but they do it with trowels picks, sometimes razor blades. It's, it's like watching paint dry to watch these guys work. And it's not for me, I'll tell you. This it at um, Harbor Branch, in, you know Harbor Branch in the United States, um, there is what's called an ancient DNA lab. It doesn't mean the lab's ancient, it means they have special ways of looking at things that are very, very old. You know, if we went in, if we sent off our DNA to um, one of the genealogical things that are going on, that's not ancient, that's present DNA. You know, it's saliva and that sort of thing. But this is, uh, they, what they do is imagine a drill on its slowest revolution. So that they don't cook it, 
with heat. You know, if you took a drill, you could drill into bone, right? Take it out, it would be red hot. And that would have ruined the deal. It would have cooked it. So they don't do that. They get it down to a revolution of, you know, it takes like a day to dig a tiny little hole because they go, <laughs> instead of whirring through the thing. And so these are some of the bones I would, I, I don't know what all those animals are, but they, they look uh, often if they can find a tooth, that's a really good source of DNA because the enamel and so on protects it. Nothing can get in there. If they ever found what they knew to be a human bone, they would stop everything. This is the archaeologists tell me. They stop everything, get everything, everybody in what we would call like a hazmat suit. And uh, because all you need is the archaeologist to drip a bead of sweat down on it or sneeze. And it's ruined the thing because now it's his DNA and that person's DNA. So they really are careful about things like that. Oh, this is uh, not me on the tour, or leading the tour, but somebody else. But we had lots of people doing, you know, other people did it along with me. And it's kind of fun. They were packed at all times. Let me stop with that. And um, let me see what, uh, let me see what else we haven't talked about. I, that seems to, hello. Did I do something? No. <laughs> I'm a real technology major. No. Oh, it's all right. I'll shut. <laughs> um, let's see. I'm just looking for some things that I probably haven't told you. Um, bear with me. Oh, one thing that you'll notice that's kind of interesting, and this is this is a little. So that's the history of it. Um, and that's what's going on today. Let me um, well, talk about two things. Uh, what's going on today is last year they closed the dig and they didn't just shovel the earth. Can you all hear me? Yeah. They, they, can't, they didn't just shovel the dirt back on it, um, but they wrap it literally, you know, pieces of permanent like plastic uh, and then they hand pack around it and up the sides and you know it's a it's a big operation to close it up they did that every year because of hurricane season and flooding and and that sort of thing but then they did it permanently they as i said gps the heck out of it so they know exactly where everything is and they they had found so much stuff in there that they 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 found what they needed to find it doesn't mean that that they have found every last bone and that there mightn't be wonderful things five feet away. But they closed it up. It looks just like a meadow now. You would not recognize it when you drive past it. It's, it looks, you know, uh, like a meadow. What they found, and this I do have to stick my glasses on. They found a total of, they found a total of 153 species <coughs> of stuff that would be animals and, and plants. They are, that is housed in over 200 boxes at Harbor Branch right now. It's all been cataloged and so on. Um, there were, are over 8,000 items that were cataloged, 8,000. That could be from pieces of carbon, and I'll tell you what they did find down there. Um, pieces of carbon from a hearth. It could be flakes, as I said, that, that they make their, that they get chipped off. They look like fish scales when you find them. I did a lot of that screening too. They look like fish scales. They're kind of translucent and they're maybe that size, you know. And, and what they're doing is 15,000 years ago, they were with a piece of bone typically flaking along the side of the, the uh, stone to make tools. Um, okay. Uh, let me tell you what they have. Oh, and they found 1,800 pieces of bone and other related materials in that overburden, which was the big mountain of earth. So those volunteers were doing an important job too. Um, so let me tell you where they stopped looking you can, in there. You can take the mic off. You oh, okay. Where they stopped looking in there. Um, 
they had been digging for four years. And by the second year, they had found a hearth. Well, a hearth can only be uh, from a people doing it. These were migratory bands of maybe 25 related individuals. In all of Florida, there may have been people numbering in the hundreds or maybe a thousand, the entire peninsula. And they migrated. They were very migratory. They'd only, they didn't build any shelters, and they would just stay in one place for maybe a couple days. Um, they found a hearth. And around the hearth were, were, was evidence that they were cooking and eating animals. They found a horse tooth right in the, in the hearth. In other words, you can't do anything with the tooth. You know, so they discarded that. You can't eat it. And, but the biggest thing they found was, and they, they uncovered it last, and they always knew it was there. There was a suspicious kind of mound of layer there. Was a juvenile bison, and it was, it was dead, of course, positioned with its, they must have just killed it, with its head away from the hearth, and its hindquarters near the hearth, you know, like cut it off and cook it. And um, they are, the, they found, and I wrote it down, they found, um, 60 pieces of this animal, 60 bits of bone, some broken, and so on. And they took out, they didn't take 60 pieces out. You don't need to keep repeating the same process. They know what it is, they DNA'd it, they took 11 pieces out. So the other 50 pieces are down, buried in this site that looks like a meadow now. Um, so they found that, and they found innumerable flakes those are the, the leavings from making tools. Um, so that's what's going on. That's what they found in the dig. That's its significance. What they have done is said, these animals and these people were in the same place at the same time, and we have proof because there are their tools, and there's the dead animal, and there's the fire. And so, uh, and that's the stuff that they're analyzing now. Let me tell you a little bit about Stone Age tools. The material that they were looking for doesn't, doesn't live in Vero Beach. It's chert. It's this. And it's very, uh, it's like uh, obsidian. It sharpens, it doesn't have a grain, like um, it splinches on long, sharp edges. <coughs> they found it in the Gainesville area and the Tampa area. Well, that's a long walk with a bag of rocks. And they, but they would take this migratory circuit all the time. Also, if they stayed in one place too long, the wolves would start hunting them, too. You know, if you've got a dead animal there, it's attractive. And, and they're gonna, you know, hunt that, too. And the saber-toothed cats and so on. So they, they, would, they would take what they could take, get out of town, and they would, move on to the next place, maybe to Melbourne, you know. Uh, they, they all knew each other, maybe they met other people, maybe they didn't, we don't know. But they were looking, and one of the things that they were looking for was this chert. And they would um, cut it into flakes. This is just some flakes of chert. You can look at this stuff later when I'm done talking. And then they would make it into tools. Okay, and this is called, not an arrowhead, but it's called a point. This is a replica. If I, I, if I had this, it would be worth way too much to just leave it to me to cart around the county. So, um, but this is what it looked like. This, and it, the archaeologists named them by style. This is called a Clovis point because it has a divot in the bottom that they, you know, bound it on like that. And it's bifaced. It's sharpened on both sides. Why? It happens to be called Clovis because the first prototype of it they found was in Clovis, a town called Clovis, New Mexico, and that was. And they dated that to, I forget now. I think 11,000 years ago. But they now found them all over North America, which means it's the same people. They made points that look like this. Another style. Uh, is this, which is called a Simpson point. Uh, once again, it's just a style. You can see a different shape. Some other, I wouldn't call them tribes, but groups of people made different shape tools. 
Um, and then they, they used things like bones and shells too to make tools. And, and you can look at those replica. And there's a bunch of fossils up there. Um, let's see. Okay. I don't think that there's too much more that I can tell you. I've given you a kind of the whole timeline. Yeah. Let me let me just stop there. And uh, I'd love to answer some questions. If you have any questions about, I, I don't pretend to know everything about archaeology, but maybe I can. Yes, sir. Well, I'm a little bit confused. Last night, I know I shouldn't have done this, but I Googled Bureau Man. Yeah. <laughs> and I got this article, I believe it was April of this year. Yes. And it quoted this Dr. Adabasio. Yes. Of saying that um, Bureau Man was no older than 7,000 years old. <coughs> That's interesting. And you've been talking about heard, Pleistocene. Yes. Okay. This is really interesting because I had not read the article, but when I went two days ago, three days ago, to pick these books up from Mr. Johnson to bring today, we were talking a little bit about that. Um, Dr. Anavasio knows his style, and he's the best in the country. And we were talking about exactly that discrepancy and um, did anybody else read that? Anybody else? Okay. We, I mean, for, for 10 years, and really even 100 years ago, they have dated this at 13,000 years ago. I'm Mr. Johnson, myself, and I'm sure others are pretty puzzled about that. I do know that Dr. Adavasio has not published for peer review as yet as yet, because they're still doing it. He may be erring, as they do, on the side of caution, where they can say the provable, the, the oldest provable human things. Don't forget, Vero Man was lost and ruined with shellac and paraffin and God knows what all. Uh, but so maybe the last provable thing on the Florida Peninsula is, is only 7,000 years old. But they have a heart at 13,000. I saw it. Um, you know, that can't, that animals didn't build that fire. So, now, it is true that this whole thing, in the last five years, four years, they haven't found one scrap more of actual human bone. Those were found 100 years ago. They have not found one scrap, but if you find their tools, if you find their heart, if you find them in the act of butchering a, an animal with scrapes and stuff, uh, who did that? You know. So that's okay. Does that in any way answer it? I'm a little puzzled. Yes, I was just expressing my confused. I yeah, confused I don't blame you. I was confused. Mr. Johnson and I literally stood at his front door talking about that, and I asked him, and he said, "Yeah." Yeah, <laughs> that's what he said, yeah. But I do know that there's other evidence in Florida of humans about 14,000 years ago. The Acilla River, I'm from Tallahassee, yes. and the Acilla River site, yes. they, they say that's unassailable evidence. Unassailable. That it's for, about 14,000, sure. 14,500 right. years right. ago, right. human right. habitation. I, I don't know the answer to your direct question. I'm puzzled. He was, I don't know. Can but I ask him? Could I ask Dr. Adamasio? Yeah. yeah, I don't she see him. him but <laughs> what, what, what was it? She should have brought him with you. Should have brought him. Yeah, he he is a he's a, a very scrupulous scientist, and so it may be in the language of the report or something that that will come to light. Yeah. So initially, when they found this, how long did they dig? This site when they first A hundred years ago, you mean? Yeah, when they first found how much digging did they oh, do? Okay. Initially? Yeah, yeah. For, first of all, they found it accidentally. They're digging right. a canal. Mm -hmm. And then everybody in town got there and started pulling bones out of the thing. Right. They had no knowledge or awareness of archaeological uh, standards uh -huh. that we have today. And, and the really short answer is. It goes on all over Vero Beach all the time. The guy who found the Kennedy bone, James Kennedy, is an amateur. 
and he was doing that. He does it all the time. Um, um, I think it's Rhody Johnson's father or something like that found a, a mammoth tooth. I, it's, it's encased in plexiglass now. It's enormous. It's a tooth like this. And that was found in 1950, I'll say. So when were the first professional archaeologists? Well, 100 years ago, they brought down people from Tallahassee okay. who were professional for the standards of that time. Um, and they came down and saw it. Yeah. Their name was Sellers. Dr. Sellers came. And Dr. The names are all in the book. But yeah, so for 100 years, for that day's version of scientific, you know, they were there. Archaeologists were there. Yeah. Yes. Was, was there an effort to relate this site to? I know there were some bones found on Turkey Creek. There were Melbourne Man. There was the um, the site up in um, in Coco. Yeah. Um, yes. Was there any, any way to look? To see yes. That? Yes. They do, and they're very much aware. All of them are aware, and if it's from, if it's contemporaneous with each other. Are they? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't know about all the sites. I used to have a big chart that had that. I, I don't know specifically that answer, but it's a matter of record, certainly, yeah. to, you know, you can Google it. But um, yes, they're absolutely aware of it. I've heard that. Our head archaeologist, because he always spoke on my tour, so I was always learning uh, from him, but he said he drew a line in um, Florida, and he said south of that line, we don't find Clover's points. We don't find this kind of tool. So yes, they're super aware. And he, that man, had just come off the Tampa underwater day. So I mean, he's they're, they they work together. Um, Andy Hemmings, Hemmings, Doctor Andrew Hemmings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you know if they're going to be doing any more? No, I don't know because I don't know anything about. I know where you talk about, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. She asked about another site that how much DNA testing they were doing. Um, they're they're sure working on this site with the thousands of pieces of material that they have, and it's all at you know in the college labs. A lot of it is being done by volunteers. <coughs> I mean, they just God love them. They sit all day and staring through a microscope with you know. A toothpick separating out grains of sand and I don't know. How much what? Originally three. Well, parts of five actually. But but when we I say parts, we're talking about thirteen thousand years ago they found a toe bone. And they know that toe bone is not from that individual. So really small parts. But the biggest one they found had uh, I forget the number, thirty bones from one body, let's say. You know, that there was the biggest part, and then there were fragments of other bodies. Remember the slide I showed you with the three red arrows? That's where they found it. Did they find any woven garments of the body? She asked if they found any evidence, yeah, evidence of craft. What? The, this is amazing that, that this was a uh, archaeologist, a student archaeologist, or a graduate student was digging, you know, like this one day. You know, and you have to imagine this tent in Florida is like 95 degrees, right? So at these, gotta love them, you know. So they're, she's digging, digging, and stops. And there were three edges, you know when you, when twine is made, you know, they, 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 they're they twisting. And she stopped. Dr. Adavasio happened to be on site then. He didn't always come to Florida from Pennsylvania. And he happens to be a fibers expert from, that's his subspecialty for paleoarchaeology. And, and it was a big find. I mean, you would have never seen it. I would have never seen it. It was like three little things poking out of a, an edge of dirt. But so that's, but that's all they found. That's all they found, but it's there, and it was human-made, and I've seen pictures of it greatly enlarged, but it's it's a fragment of what we would call rope or strength. So, yeah. The depth of the overburden. Yeah. What does that material constitute? 
It's the stuff they dug out of the canal 100 years ago. I knew that. Oh. And where does it come from? Does it happen over time? Is this... Oh, what makes it happen? Yes. Yeah. You know, have you ever been to Rome? Okay, and you're standing at the um, Pantheon. Out, is that any of you ever seen? It's in a pit, and it's tw and it's um, things that are in cities. Things that are down 20 feet are about 2,000 years old, because cities accrete garbage a lot faster than at what. What would it be out in the country? Plant matter, <clears throat> you know, stuff washed in from a storm, anything. But if you've ever seen archeological digs in the city, they're always many feet below, well, how does that happen? It's garbage, it's stuff that just piles on top of it, you know? What does it come from? As I said, it could be plant matter in cities, and for sure it's, it's pills, garbage. You haven't mentioned Meteorite falls, which is oh yeah, small. that's I think it's infinitesimal amounts right, of it. But yes, but it could constant. be. Sure, sure. I our neighbor was an airline pilot. He worked for United, and he said every uh, year they take down, uh, take apart the plane, they super clean the plane, and they pull off hundreds of pounds of garbage. You know, your gum wrapper that fell down that little space by the seat. Yeah. yeah. And I said, well, why would you bother? And he said, fuel, you know? It's the weight of another human being or two. So that's what happens when, when we get a hold of things. Yeah. What else? Anything else? Was the, was the overburden what was on top of the material you were looking for, or was it the spoil from when they built the canal? Both, both. It was the spoil from the canal, yeah. which happened to be on the very place they wanted to dig. Yeah because 100 years ago, those archeologists had pinpointed it. They had said, in those days, they said so many feet west of the railroad yeah. track. That's the way they said it. You know, in a direct uh, western track or west, east, so many degrees. And so they had pinpointed it. They didn't have GPSs, but they had. They could do that. What? They could do that yeah, yeah, they, they could do all that. And, um, do you, your hands up or, no, okay. Anything else? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, currently there's a question of who owns antiquity. Yeah, we're talking about artifacts, though. I mean, like Greek vases and. Bones? Bones. We're just talking about sure. old stuff. Sure, sure. Who owns it? Yeah, right now, um, not us because they went looking, this stuff was dispersed all over the United States, 100 years ago, they found bones, and, you know, yeah, I showed you that one picture. And then they just sort of gave it or sold it or whatever away to so many, you know, 30 museums in the United States. They went back looking for it, because they thought, well, maybe we can get some intact DNA out of a tooth in the who knows what. And they couldn't find a bone, they couldn't find a thing. So cataloging was, very poor back then. God knows what all happened to it, but they have real. They went on a several-year search and couldn't find it. Anything else? What else, Don? Well, thanks. Thank you. Very much. Before you leave, if any of you, there's three copies left. If any of you are interested in that book, it's a, it's a terrific read. It's really fun. Certainly take one of the brochures, which I've passed out to a lot of people, and come on up and take a look at the stuff here. You can handle it. That's why we're ending early, so you guys can come up. Also, please see Jane if you're interested in the Field Matter event, and see our folks at the front for the bus. Uh, $20. Yes.